Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Science Faction. The only show where a scientist, a comedian, and a comedian scientist come together to discuss science. Comedically. Hello, and welcome to Science Faction 168. Science Faction, let's discuss the recent Twitter contest. Yeah, we're getting some fan participation. This is a right. weird moment for the show. For those fans who may have missed the last few episodes, we, of course, originally did the periodic table of the elements. Then we went over the logical fallacies. Now we are looking for a new intro bit to introduce to our audience every single episode. What topic would you like us to cover? We have been putting this to you guys, to our fans, to tweet us at Faction Science and let us know what you think we should be covering on a regular basis. Damien, let's go over some of our entries so far. Jimmy McCluskey, who, if there ever was a name that sounded like a fake cop name. That really, while he was writing this tweet, he was spinning a baton and walking down New York City. You could call me Officer James McCluskey. Jimmy McCluskey writes, For the beginning of your episode, you could describe a neat science discovery in each U.S. state or other geographical area. Okay, there's not going to be a lot going on south of the Mason-Dixon. I'm just going to say that right now. I'd say breakthroughs in the contraction of diabetes are... That's very, very true. And new forms of racism. And I like how that one, because it essentially would just turn into us roasting a state, or me, my job would just be to roast whatever state it's from. You do like doing that. Dave Hasselnick, which sounds like a fake name, but when you hear the question, I think you'll understand why. Right. He didn't have a suggestion, but asked, why science shows never touch UFOs? I think we've covered UFOs in one form or another eh, three to four dozen times. We talk about SETI. We talk about SETI. We talk about BS UFO research. We talk about, you know, Carl Sagan and all. We, we've talked about all of the, even the Fermi paradox. All of that touches on that. Maybe we're not, maybe he's saying we're not spending enough time debunking the crazy conspiracy theories. I'm going to hope aliens. so. I'm going to vote for you on that one, bud. And Sam Dory writes, for the opening, you could run through geological eras. And then I assume he's writing to you, Bobby, when right. he says, your dinosaur expertise would come in handy. First of all, I like that sweet burn, bud. Yeah, Again, going back, to, going back to the dinosaur thing. But I actually do like that idea. Geological eras are really important, and nobody really knows them unless they go through any kind of geology, anthropology, archaeology, maybe even some biology classes. And when you talk about things in science, including things we talk about on this show, we frequently use the designation of what era something happened in. And if you can't tell the difference between the Permian and the Cretaceous, you're going to have no idea what a lot of people are talking about in general science speak. I did get a text as well from a fan who uh, has my phone number but doesn't like to play by contest rules and right. get a Twitter account, Yeah, who suggested that we focus on congressmen who are anti-science. That would also be good, and please stop giving out your phone numbers to random gentlemen you meet. I'm not giving it to the ladies, so that way it's not sexist. Speaking of somebody who's not sexist, I, of course, am your host, comedian and archaeologist, Robert Timothy, and with me, as always, is my comedian, Mr. Damien Mercado. Damien, how are you doing this afternoon? Doing great, but you say you're not sexist, but you mansplain everything to me. That is true. And, of course, we have a new scientist this evening, Connor. Connor, how are you doing? Good, good. Connor, now you are actually a chemical engineer, but you now currently work in biotech, right? That is correct. All my chemical engineering happens through a, a biological lens. What is biology other than just makeshift chemistry, right? I, I mean, everything is a chemical, so. That's right. Uh, well, Better than an evil lens. I yeah, mean, right, yeah, yeah. fantastic to have you out here. And if, after you check out Science Faction, go ahead and check out the Madhouse Comedy Club here along the skyline of beautiful downtown San Diego. And if you're not there, go ahead and check out our website at www.thescienceFaction.com for all the articles we cover here as well as some we didn't get to. But for now, we got some real good ones. Let's jump right into science articles. From molecules to particles, this is Science Articles. All right, guys. A first article, we may have cured diabetes. This is cool because you regularly say we have a lot of really good articles, but there's some crappy archaeological article or something very this informative, exciting archaeological articles. I agree. This, these are not archaeological articles. Still informative and exciting. This is just the first time you haven't lied to the fans in a while. So, I, <laughs> I mean, you should be commended. All right, guys. So diabetes, especially type 2 diabetes, we are talking about either your body's ability to produce insulin going down or your body becoming resistant to that insulin. That means you have problems then with sugar and with your body maintaining its homeostasis in terms of sugar. That's why we have to inject people with insulin. It's fair to note that before we came up with artificial insulin, 
people would essentially die pretty quickly after contracting type 2 diabetes. Even now with insulin, we have to have a lot of people get amputations, surgeries. It can permanently affect other parts of their health. And quite frankly, it can still kill them. It is a really big deal. And the numbers of people with type 2 diabetes are growing almost exponentially. It is thought by 2030 that type 2 diabetes will be the seventh leading cause of death in the world. I mean, if you got, if you died from type 2 diabetes in more lean times, couldn't you argue you deserve to die? You were just Marie Antoinette you... pounding cake. <laughs> just... No, she was letting them eat cake. Yeah, you're right, actually. That, that's true. You had to work to die from diabetes back then. Though, of course, you also had less information about what diabetes did. I feel like there was some old-timey doctor like, the more sugar you eat, the more energy you have. Cake a day keeps me away. What these researchers did is they thought... Why are we just looking at giving insulin to people? Let's solve the underlying problem, that insulin resistance. So what they did is they went looking for the initial cause of this and went, wondered how they can fix it. Now, for a long time, we thought that the cause of this kind of type 2 diabetes, that insulin resistance, is an enzyme known as low molecular weight protein tyrosine phosphate, or for short, L-M-P-T-P. It rolls off the tongue. Rolls right off the tongue. I, I mean, so they, they say this is the underlying cause, mm -hmm. but, I mean, how much of the onion do you want to peel away? I mean, <laughs> it's just the enzyme. We could go even further back and trace it back to, they say, influenced by genes or even yeah. bad life habits. I mean, Sure, yeah, and your genes play a big role in it. There are people who can eat the exact same diet, who do the exact same amount of exercise. One of them gets type 2 diabetes and the other one doesn't. So like everything, it's that, that mixture of nature and nurture. I mean, going to your point about lifestyle, Aren't we giving people a free pass to just eat what you want? I mean, uh... Isn't that what we all want? I mean, Don't we want that free pass? I mean, great. I mean, has, has Coca-Cola been putting in the work in the lab? <laughs> I mean, what, what's interesting to me is if you think of how many people are suffering from type 2 diabetes now and how many people use insulin on a regular basis, if you do come up with a cure, an actual-to-God cure for diabetes you're going to be putting a lot of people out of business, right? There are, there's a lot of money in that because it's something that you don't just take once. It's not like antibiotics. I got sick. I took my antibiotics. Now I'm a little bit better. Or I contracted a specific disease. I need some antivirals for. I'm going to take these and then I'm going to get better. This is something that as of right now, once you get type 2 diabetes, you are on that insulin for the rest of your life. Picturing uh, lifespans in the American rural South, or just let's say the South, skyrocketing. This will, this will bankrupt our country. Well, what these scientists did is they said, okay, we see this LMPTP is possibly causing this diabetes. Let's take a drug that can block that and block the effects of this, especially potent in the liver. Let's take a drug that we think can block it, give it to these people, and see what happens. Now, obviously, you can't just throw it into people right away, so you're using a mouse model on this. You give these mice diabetes, which, by the way, has to be one of the most interesting things to do as a scientist. What's your job, research assistant? I force feed my sugar and cake most of the day until they get super fat and have diabetes. Some kind of weird mouse foie gras. Yeah. <laughs> See, if you're the mouse, though, when you, like we've talked about the horrible life of a mouse, just right. eating a bunch of, of awesome cakes and stuff. Great. I was worried that that method might be too inefficient. They just had some like chemical they could, they could inject in you that just throws your body into diabetes. I think it would be funny if what they did is they just started putting out dishes of food and seeing which mice were the best eaters. Like They ate the most cake, and they slowly bred and segregated towards that until they got the fattest, biggest mice. Every mouse looks like Gus from Cinderella. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was actually a documentary about this experiment. <laughs> so what they did is they took these mice, they first gave them diabetes, which sounds kind of mean, but also a fun type of mean. It's better than the mice on the amputation studies. I'll put it that way. Wait, I mean, to, to make the study more efficient, so you don't want mice running around burning those calories, do they take the mice from the amputation study? <laughs> And then force feed them. Uh, that would be good. And then you've already circumvented that whole having to cut off somebody's foot because they have diabetes. Science needs to be more efficient. <laughs> Proactive. Uh, so they give them this compound that blocks that particular enzyme. And what they found is that these mice started responding to insulin again. Not only that, they started being able to produce their own. After a few months' time, what found is the mice's sugar levels had essentially gone back to normal. What we don't know is long-term whether this will work over a lifespan. Is this an actual cure for type 2 diabetes, or is this more of something that staves off it, or is a treatment that only has to be administered every once in a while as opposed to every single day, like insulin would? Why this is exciting is 
if we actually have a drug that reverses that diabetes and puts you back into the normal range, you no longer have diabetes, now you can go on with your life, you have taken off a lifelong ailment for a gigantic percentage of people in this country and worldwide. That's fucking amazing. And it's it's kind of what we're shoot for. It's one of those we cured cancer type things. Curing type 2 diabetes is going to help almost as many people. This is going to play hell with the personal trainer industry. Tons of high school dropouts are going to have nothing to do. <laughs> so, a couple of things to keep in mind when we talk about these studies. One, they have not even proved that it cures this in mouse models. What they have proved is a good response to the mice they use that already have type 2 diabetes. What they haven't proven is that this works ubiquitously, even in mice, or that it's permanent lasting. So, again... This could just be a treatment that you take every few months, which would still be a huge deal. It's still great. It still takes away a lot of issues like actual diabetic comas that people can go into when they don't have their medicine on them. It is a big deal, but it's different than a cure. I prefer dialysis, for being honest. Dialysis and, and insulin injections. Hot nurses. I mean, do we know how long the mice had diabetes prior to receiving this treatment? Well, they gave the mice diabetes purposely through like an overfeeding program. So I, I think once you have type 2 diabetes, once you pass a certain threshold, you essentially have it for life, right? Now, you can get up to that threshold and be somewhat diabetic and then be pulled back. But I think there is a line you get to where once you reach a certain level of insulin resistance, it doesn't matter if you've had it for a year or 10 years. But think about their lifespan, right? So obviously having diabetes for a year for a mouse would be like half of its life as opposed to for one of us, right? It's like right. a hymen once it breaks. It... <laughs> it's the diabetes hymen, as yes. you've heard, <laughs> cited in many science articles. Yeah, and, and, but that's just looking at, uh, I'm not an expert on diabetes, but that's just focusing in on the insulin resistance yes. portion. So are there other biological systems that are affected and breaking down the longer you have it? There obviously has to be, right? There, Because any kind of insulin resistance, unless it's being treated perfectly, is going to have kind of global effects across your body. So you're right. We should look at studies that not only look at how it treats mice, but how it treats mice that have had it as a more lifelong condition or as a new condition. That's actually a really good point. And the other thing to remember is, again, as we've been kind of beating around here the whole time, we're only talking about mice. So that's a big difference for a like lot of... mice lives not matter? Like, <laughs> is that what you're... They, they literally don't. Yeah, you're right. Actually, yeah. we set the bar pretty low there. Yeah, we, we, we sell things in mass whose only job it is is to murder mice. Yeah, I used to buy baby mice to feed my snake. Right. A, a universally unloved animal. Yeah. Like, uh, one of the animals we're programmed to fear. <laughs> yeah, and, I, and, and you bought those mice just to kill them. Like, they are sold just to be killed. But I go into the store to buy some puppies to feed my alligator, and I'm a fucking monster. <laughs> So we know that mouse models don't always translate over to human models. We know sometimes some human models don't even translate over, depending on, you know, your unique biochemical makeup, your unique genetics, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, as we talked about just now, the situations that led you to that particular disease. How long have you had that diabetes? So when we're talking about mouse models, we can't immediately jump up and be like, yes, we've cured diabetes. This is done. I wish, like, if the Tuskegee experiment was going to happen, I wish they had, like, done it with this. Like, like, like yeah, we tested a, a, a new uh, drug that cures diabetes, not syphilis or right. something. <laughs> like, yeah, we did, okay, truth time, we did do an unconsensual medical procedure on a, on a lot of people, but... But instead, we just cured their diabetes. Yeah. Also, would have worked well in the South, both of those. But regardless, this is very promising. It's going to be interesting to see where this leads. We also have to think of what these future tests are going to look like when we finally do go into human trials. So let's say this keeps going. It passes a few more mouse models. They'll usually bump it up and do a few more tests before they actually give consent to do human trials. So we shouldn't even expect the first human trials to begin for at least another two to four years. Once those get on and you do have some kind of human trials, you're going to see them start with small end numbers, small sample sizes, usually some kind of long-term monitoring, and then eventually it will go through FDA approval, which in and of itself takes a few years. So realistically, even if this drug was perfect, even if we found out it worked, if it scores high marks on all the mouse tests, then runs through human trials, scores really high there with no negative side effects, and then gets like the quickest FDA clearance you've ever gotten with no problems, which of course doesn't happen that much, if all of that happened, you'd be looking at maybe 10 years. Now, I'm not a big pharma conspiracy type guy. I think almost all of that stuff is BS, but there is something to the idea that you can still buy up the patent to a drug like this at some point, and if it's more economically viable for you to buy that patent up and not release it and then continue selling your insulin as opposed to release something that then makes your insulin essentially not usable anymore, you might want to do that too. So 
for all you people who think of the big pharma conspiracies, they have at least a 10-year head start to go buy this patent. I mean, the insulin industry has already gone through a couple transitions, right? Mm -hmm. So I mean, before we could make synthetic insulin, we right. had to we had to extract that from, you know, pigs. Yeah. So I don't know if the pig industry or the pig <laughs> lobby wasn't powerful enough to stop big pharma, but, right. you know, it's already changed hands a couple times. They're just farmers. That's yeah. why... The Midwest has been wrecked. It Wait, pharma or farmer? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that's where it came from. <gasps> All right, let's move right on to article number two. Lead exposure is why the 70s suck so hard. That's why? Yeah, well, that and the cars. I mean, really, I mean, you're still, lead exposure, you're still, I mean, there was coke in the 70s. That's true. A lot of venereal diseases were still manageable and treatable with antibiotics. That's right. You know what? Maybe the 70s were better than I gave them credit for, actually. <laughs> so this is a very, very interesting study that comes out of New Zealand and what's so interesting about this is it has what we would call in science like the most ideal study conditions. Because when you look at something like lead exposure among groups of people, you have so many ethical issues to deal with. So for those of you who don't know, lead introduced in the environment, especially as a young child is growing up, can affect brain development. We've known that for a long time. But what's hard to do is quantify exactly how much that affects brain development. Because think about it from this perspective, especially with studies in the United States. We see a huge lead intake from things like old paint or old lead pipes, that kind of stuff. Well, there's also a correlation with socioeconomic status when we talk about that. Who's in a house that's most likely to be painted with old paint and not repainted in the last 40 years? Hipsters. Some hipsters and not rich people, exactly. Who's most likely to have shitty old pipes that people around them and their city councils don't care about fixing? people in poor socioeconomic conditions. So that means when we look at lead exposure as a detriment to IQ in the U.S., a lot of times they're confounding factors that make it hard to isolate lead as the active variable. This study is almost perfect in the sense that, one, it comes from New Zealand, so who cares about those guys? But number two, this study was incredibly precisely monitored. This study in New Zealand actually tracked 1,000 people from zero to 40. They measured their blood levels at regular intervals and did IQ tests at regular intervals. Well, of course, when you're going to put lead pipes in a Maori village. Too, too many of our, our, our rugby players were going for scholarships and more academic things. We needed to take that away. So we put a... Does this explain the face tattoos? Is this why you guys were getting the face tattoos? Yeah, we said, if Mike Tyson's doing it, why not Mary's? I think it went the other way. I think it was actually Maori's first, then Mike Tyson. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Mark Tyson is the real trendsetter. Well, what they looked at is they had leaded gasoline in New Zealand. Now, in the United States, we got rid of leaded gasoline in the 1970s, so we had it from about the 1920s to the 1970s. Uh, in New Zealand, they actually didn't get rid of it till about the 1990s. Those of you who are wondering on a side tangent, why the fuck is there lead in gasoline? We found it in the 1920s. It not only boosts octane, but helps remove kind of an engine knock. So we put it in gasoline, but lead doesn't burn up through that combustion process. So it gets shot out through the tailpipe becomes basically ambient in the air, settles in the ground, and children get exposed to it, especially those who are either playing outside or who eat a little bit of dirt, like kids tend to do every I once mean, in a go while. Going back to the ethical portion of this, uh -huh. I mean, it was already happening in New Zealand. They already had the leaded gasoline, yep. but someone had to have the motivation to do this study. So someone right. had a hypothesis in like the 70s, okay, mm -hmm. we got rid of it in the U.S., you know, those schmucks in New Zealand, yeah. they haven't gotten rid of it yet. Are they just monitoring them and like not letting them know that this is bad or it would be like if somebody came to america now and they were like you know what let's do a study on what happens when you get rid of the epa <laughs> like we all know it's going to be bad but we can't change it right now so let's at least watch this fucking plane crash happen uh, yeah good point you know there is to us there would be that ethical consideration of like wait are we like infringing upon this essentially group that can't defend itself and the answer is yes we are but let's at least watch it happen from a New Zealand governor's perspective, or a New Zealand legislator's perspective, uh, we have a very low population density. It's true. And a lot of sheep. And uh, dumb sheep can scent much easier. <laughs> and so... So you did this all on sheep. So, I mean, like, you know, a lot of us were, you know, a bit more fertile, a little less impotent at the time. We're thinking with our, with our Johnsons, or as we call them, our Kiwis. And what they found when they were doing this is they found a decreased IQ in children who had been exposed to that lead they found that the decrease in IQ was based pretty geometrically on the amount of lead you were exposed to. So since, again, they had this very, very cool study where they were able to actually look at lead levels in the blood and compare it with IQ levels and see that over time, longitudinally, from the ages of 0 to 40, 
they were able to say, look, now we can control for socioeconomic conditions. We can control for all these other factors. We can look at exactly how much lead is in their blood. We don't have to assume it based on what we think their exposure was. And we can tell exactly what their IQ was. They see a downfall of IQ that just goes linearly with that lead exposure. And you see that for a certain amount of lead in the body per milliliter, you see a 1.5 point drop in IQ. And you can essentially map that drop in IQ. So if you happen to live a little bit closer to the road, you were kind of fucked. With respect to our uh, New Zealand guest uh, who just left a second ago, right? the All Blacks have been dominating in rugby. I'm not saying, I, remember, increases your octane, Damien. You you put a bunch of lead in these kids and they run like crazy. Listen, I'm a football coach. I want to win. I start thinking outside the box. That's right. You start thinking outside the safe lead box. Yeah, Lead-lined uh, Gatorade containers. <laughs> It is interesting, though, because if we think of lead exposure here, we often think about those other sources, those things like paint and pipes and stuff. We forget that they were it was essentially ambient within the air because of these fuel additives that were put in for a long time. And because of that, in places like New Zealand, they were spread across wide socioeconomic boundaries. You didn't just have people who had older stuff or older infrastructure. It was in the air and therefore spread across kind of most socioeconomic conditions, which makes it much easier to control for in these later studies. And and because of that, we were able to actually hammer it down. Exactly 1.5 IQ points goes down on average for this exposure to lead. That's amazing because it means that now we can say not only do we know that lead affects the brain, it affects cognitive development, it affects later IQ, and it affects that IQ all the way into adulthood because these are longitudinal studies that go very far into to being 40 years old. But we can say exactly to what degree it does. So we can actually start drawing blood out of people right now, take their blood levels, and be able to predict both future IQ. And in this particular study, they also looked at job status and current job they have as a 38, 40-year-old person and see how it will affect them. That's kind of crazy. It means we can look at places like Flint, Michigan, and say, look, for every bit of lead in these kids' blood, we can expect this le much less IQ and, by the way, this much of a lower job status when they're 40 years old. It's a real easy conversation to have with each individual parent. Here's where your child would have been on the right. success meter. <laughs> yeah, let's just say, start investing in retirement. Don't plan on them taking care of you when you're older. On the plus side, he is much more likely to buy a lottery ticket, which, despite its super low odds, is his best chance of breaking out of this. <laughs> Ironic, huh? Everything kind of balances out that way. I mean, so this is also just IQ. I mean, there's yes. other ways we can measure intelligence mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, success. So... Would it be worthwhile to look at other measures to determine it, does lead have that same negative effect or neutral or even mm -hmm. a positive effect on, on other measures? Well, and, and that is one of the other reasons I like this study is because they also look at uh, your job status or your job level at 40 years old. You know, you're not just looking at, like you said, IQ is to some extent subjective and it's hard to say it's universal in certain forms. So if you start looking also at what these kids achieve by the time they're 40, you have put a, kind of another marker there. And they have those are also correlated. So a couple of things to remember, though. We are still talking about a correlational study. We cannot say for sure this is causational, no matter how many variables we try to account for. And You've try been to bought by Big Lead. I right. knew it since the start of this show. <laughs> no matter how many you try to account for, it's it, you can't do it with 100% accuracy. We always have to acknowledge that correlation does not necessarily equal causation, though in this particular study, it does seem to very, very strongly point that way. We also have to think about Gradually over time, IQ can change for other reasons. So do we have enough controls to say that this isn't just because the way IQ tests are measured, your age is factored into it, and if you hit a plateau of intelligence and keep getting to an older age, you would look as if you were having a declining IQ. So we have to make sure that whatever tests they're doing, their control group and their active group wouldn't somehow have a difference in that kind of gradual IQ decline just based on the mathematical numbers of how we assess what IQ is. Could you use a magnet to get the lead out? No, you could not. Like throw the kid in an MRI and it yeah, just gets just ripped pulls out violently. It, just rips it out of his skin. Every blood vessel all over his body, internal organs. Very interesting stuff. We already knew lead was bad for you. What really this, this study does that makes it so interesting is it quantifies how bad into, and, and just how severe it is and what we should expect from each exposure to lead. It can then allow us to, by the way, go and do some kind of early intervention. That's going on in Flint, Michigan right now. We're finding these kids who have high lead exposure. We're putting them through special education training that will hopefully help them overcome a little bit of the obstacles they have to face. If we see that people have certain levels of lead, we can actually measure, okay, you have this much lead, you need this much training. You need this much intervention to try and help you out. 
hopefully that can try and mitigate some of the damage. We've been able to get almost every single one of those lead-affected kids in Flint, Michigan, a degree in communications. <laughs> it wasn't even hard. <laughs> they did just fine. We couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> At Arizona State. All right. Let's move right on to podcasts. Podcasts. Podcast, motherfucker. All right, guys, this week's podcast, one we've never talked about before, Joe Rogan, the Joe Rogan experience. Oh, Bobby's doing a Joe Rogan podcast. <laughs> surprise, fucking surprise. For our listeners at home, his erection, I'm not going to say it's the biggest it's ever been, but it's up there. It's still one of my favorite examples of a guy who used to be kind of a science denier and a little bit of a conspiracy theorist who has come to be, and I will say this, one of the foremost educators of science out there, at least in terms of broadly spreading it. If you listen to his show, he brings on some of the best Science minds, science leaders, discusses very interesting ideas. He brings on Neil deGrasse Tyson. Alex Jones. Uh, he actually did have Alex Jones oh, on there, which did. was pretty interesting. <laughs> but he brings on a lot of uh, different types of scientists. And in this case, he brought on one of my all-time favorites, Lawrence Krauss. Lawrence Krauss, because you too also make snide comments to religious people whenever you see them. <laughs> That's true. I love Lawrence Krauss. I think he has given insight into the world as an actual researcher but much like Carl Sagan, I like that he also works towards science education in and of itself. And he helped me personally understand certain things in astrophysics that I would have never understood because it was way above my head if I were to grab any research or papers published and try and read it. I would not, it would not click. But if you have never heard of him before, please listen to me right now. Press pause on this podcast. Look up on YouTube a talk he gives called A Universe from Nothing. It will help explain to you how this entire universe was formed in a way that you had never even considered before. It will answer so many of the questions you have as terms of galactic origins, how something can form from nothing, what we talk about when we even say the word nothing, so this kind of overall equilibrium that the universe has. All of the stuff that is super complicated, he breaks down in a way that's so colloquially understandable by even laymen like myself, it is fantastic. Go listen to it. It's 50 minutes. It's completely free, and it will be one of the best 50 minutes you will ever spend in your life. Now, I know a lot of you are like me, and you listen to Bobby talk, and you think, what's some stupid dinosaur-loving scientist? Oh, you know, he's hoity-toity. He's a shill for big lead. I don't need to listen to him. Well, take from the other side, an idiot. And I've watched this Lawrence Krauss video mm -hmm. at Bobby's suggestion, and it's really good. Although I thought it was like an hour-long lecture. It is. It's about 50 minutes. It's a great way to spend an hour. It will make you understand the universe much more. And he went on Joe Rogan and talked about some of those ideas, some of those universe origin ideas. <sighs> he also talked about some other ideas in physics and science in general, pseudoscience, science denialism. He did a great fucking job. And Joe Rogan is a great type of host to bring that out in him because he's one of those few guys who isn't afraid to say, I don't understand what you're saying or tell me that in an easier way while still going along with the person and not placating them. Fantastic interview. I, as a person who loves science, who has read or watched almost everything Lawrence Krauss has ever done, I learn new stuff just from this interview of him. So I'd highly recommend you guys go check it out. Joe Rogan Experience, he interviews Lawrence Krauss, and he will explain a few high-level concepts to you that I wouldn't even want to get into here in terms of review because they are far too complicated for me. But I did come out feeling like I had a broad understanding of what they were and made me want to go research it more, which in my mind is always the sign of a good piece of information or podcast or show if it makes you get up and pull up Google right afterwards and start looking into things yourself. He's actually a huge fan of, of this podcast, by the way. Lawrence Krauss is. Yeah, yeah, I'm so flat. Lawrence, uh, you are a hero of mine. Thank you so much for listening. Yeah, he actually sent me a direct Twitter message. Um, I'll show it to you after the show. Okay. And then we can never talk about it on air again. Fair enough. Uh, and he said he really wants to be on the show, but he doesn't have enough time in the foreseeable future. Uh -huh. But he said that as soon as he dies, I can channel him. Oh, okay. So you will do Damien Channels a Dead Scientist where you fake channel a scientist and it will be Lawrence Krauss. Well, um, he said that's, he says like, I'm, I'm booked till the day I die. So you this can have me day one. <laughs> well, he's planned his date of death. When you're a genius like Lawrence Krauss, first off, you're super organized. You plan things way in advance. Right. Secondly, a lot of people want your time. He barely has a moment to himself. It's just him and Rogan. Now I'm pissed at Rogan. Now, oh, Rogan got him instead of me. Oh, uh, by the way, there's also been a long-standing thing that I've never talked about with Jane Goodall as well. Very oh, similar. See. You argument. guys both have contracts? You're like, I will channel you once you die. Are these exclusive contracts? Can oh, they no, go into any other medium? Jane Goodall has been on the, the podcast more than Dr. Ava, you could argue. Right. And, uh, do we, yeah, we don't all, I'm sorry, we don't always invite you out for a beer when we out. She was like, yeah, as soon as I die, you can channel me. Fair enough. All right, guys, let's move on to our favorite game, I Call BS. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. I Call. I call. Ring, ring. I Call BS. 
Who, who's our favorite game? Because I know it's not mine, and, and you've never played I've this never before. Played it this was, it, but the worlds. Probably Lawrence Krauss's, I would imagine. Yeah, we didn't if he's bring... a listener, I mean, everybody loves this game. Yeah, in our private con- he's He would be unlikely to bring it up to me, knowing it's That's a true, subject. and as most people always tell me, you got, you're way too easy on Damien. Stop coddling him. Uh, he, he he gets off way too easy with a lot of his losses, which are just embarrassing. So please, kind of put screws to him a little bit. Take the kid gloves off, you know? Connor, you are uh, an accomplished scientist. You wouldn't think you would need all the advantages Bobby's about to give you. But you were about to play the most lopsided game in your favor in history. The only advantage that you have walking in when you walk through this door is that you're not Damien. And thankfully, it's the only advantage you'll need. All right, I Call VS, of course, is the game where I read four science news articles, and my panelists can pick to see which ones are real and which ones are BS, standing for bad science. Are you guys ready to play? Yeah, I'm, I'm ready for my weekly torture. Let's do it. All right. Article number one. New research shows that after stopping meth use, addicts have a die-off of neurons leading to their relapse. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. My neurons are just fine, sir. I thought I noticed a funny smell around you when you showed up today. I'm pretty twitchy today. Also, a stolen car stereo in your hand. That was my other (laughs) tip-off. I'm not putting it down. You can take it. All right. And Connor. You know, at first, it... It sounds plausible to have, if you're taking meth, um, you know, your brain gets used to that, and and then once you go off, you start experiencing uh, withdrawals, which uh, could be attributed to neural die-off. However, I'm going to go with bad science because, uh, you know, I just don't know how you would measure neural die-off. All right. Notice how the scientist copied my answer again. Well, I think he actually gave a very cogent answer, and you just started getting the meth shakes, so yeah, there, I don't know. There were certainly semantical differences between our answers, but... <laughs> All right, article number two. New research suggests that sexual abuse, but not other forms of abuse, cause children to hit puberty later than their non-abused peers. Damien, is this science or bad science? This is bad science. I still haven't developed puberty. I'm doing fine. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, except for the meth stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I'm way too high on meth to go through puberty right now. <laughs> and Connor. I'm going to go science on this one. Uh, you know, hormonal systems can be pretty complex. Um, and I think it, it's feasible that uh, external experiences can uh, affect your uh, hormonal systems. Every erection is proof of that. All right, on to article number three. Researchers have discovered a fish with an opioid-like venom. Damien, is this science... Or bad science. Uh, before I answer that, I, I really kind of pictured a the more you know after Bobby <laughs> said, every erection is proof of that. <laughs> Why did NBC fire you again? I... Not enough sexual harassment. That was the problem. would be fine at Fox News. Yeah. This is science, and it's the only place I can get my fix after I stop meth. Yeah, every, every once in a while, you're done with meth. You start getting the jitters, and you just start grabbing random goldfish and attaching them to the inside of your arm. Yeah, so is this San Diego Bay tuna, or...? I I know, it's a very specific fish, I would imagine. I have them in, like, a piranha tank, and I lower myself in there like I am my, my own vo- Bond villain. <laughs> and I get high, and then I forget to let myself up. Just covered in fish gravy. All right, and Connor. Yeah, I think that's science. I mean, other opioids present in nature, uh, for example, poppies. But, you know, having venom that, you know, gets your uh, victims high and kind of mm. stops them in their tracks. You know? I, I was thinking, like, wouldn't that actually be a detriment? Like, you bite the fucking guy once, and then he leaves. He's like, oh, whatever. And then he comes back, like, the, the couple hours. He's like, hey, bite me again. Hey, come on. Just keep, <laughs> come on. Keep, hey, if you, if you harass that guy enough, he'll get you high. Well, the fish with the uh, meth venom is uh, much more effective. That guy comes back way more often. But also way more angry. <laughs> All right. Shit. Article number four. Researchers have found that humans only begin truly relating to other people at the age of four, and surprisingly, the reason has nothing to do with the brain. Now, real quick, when you might say, what do you mean relating to people? There's an interesting thing that happens in kind of the three- to four-year-old age gap that you can actually try at home as an experiment on your own kids. Kids before the age of four don't really have the concept of how other individuals or other people think. And right around four, they, it kind of like suddenly switches on, and they do. And if you want to know whether or not your three- or four-year-old is in that place, all you have to do is ask him one of these very easy-type scenario questions. You say, okay, here's a scenario. Uh, there's a kid. He's, he's in the kitchen with his mom. His mom shows him a toy and then puts the toy inside of a box on the kitchen counter, and the kid goes outside and plays. And then while the kid is playing, the mom takes the toy out of the box, closes the box, and puts that toy in the cabinet. And then the kid comes back in. 
and you ask your own child, where will that kid look for the toy? Now, kids three or under will say they'll look in the cabinet because that kid knows that the toy has been moved to the cabinet. They can't envision another person's perspective that doesn't have that knowledge, and therefore their answer is, oh, they'll look in the cabinet. Four and on, they'll say, well, when he went outside to play, the toy was in the box. He doesn't know it got moved. He would look in the box. It's a very simple, easy test about seeing whether or not your child has gotten to the point where they can actually relate to others in that mode. So what we're saying is they have found this out. We've known this for a long time. They found out why that happens. And surprisingly, it has nothing to do with the brain. Damien, is this science or bad science? I'm trying to think back to my childhood to think how I reacted. But I think because of uh, so many things in our second question that delayed my going into puberty till being 35-year-old man. Right. Well, the first I've two actually... questions, because some of it was meth. So. Yeah. yeah, well, I mean, between meth and being diddled all yeah. the time, I blocked out most of my childhood. So I, I, you know what? I'm just going to guess and say science. All right. And Connor? I'm going to go bad science. If you're imagining uh, something from someone else's perspective, to me, that involves the brain. So... Something that, uh, you know, does involve the brain, I, you know, I'm just not too sure. Good answer. I like this because you guys have mixed up your answers a lot. There's only two that you guys matched on, the other two you didn't. This is going to be an exciting game. All right, let's go back and see how you guys did. Follow along at home and see how you did. Article number one. New research shows that after stopping meth use, addicts have a die-off of neurons leading to relapse. Both of you guys thought this was bad science, and this one is bad science. Very, very interesting research. What they actually found is that you have neurogenesis. So you have neurons growing after you stop meth. And what they think is this is actually part of the high relapse rates of methamphetamine. Methamphetamine has an 88% recidivism or relapse rate, meaning even if you go to treatment, 88% of people can't stop using it. It's hard to quit the toothless dragon. That's right. <laughs> but what they found is one of the reasons is after you stop using it, your brain's reward system, which is wired to want that meth, it wants it right back, it starts neurogenesis. It starts linking with other neurons, parts of your pleasure center, to other parts of your brain. And it's the same process we use to learn things. It's literally the same learning process that we use when we're in school and we're doing anything else. But in this case, it's your brain trying to get you to start using that methamphetamine again by relating the pleasure parts of your brain, by linking neurons to the stuff that's associated with that methamphetamine use. It's one of the reasons that people oftentimes have relapses when they go back to an old environment in which they used to use those drugs even long after they've quit. It's because their brain is triggered to go, oh, fuck, this environment, that meth... Thing. Oh man, I've got the, the the neurons link, and you all of a sudden get a pleasure rush, and you want to go back to that meth again. Hey, what's up, Scratchy Randy? I'm clean now, so don't don't try to tempt me with no amphetamines this time. What's very cool is this group, which actually discovered that particular little piece of information a couple years ago, started with a specific drug that inhibits that type of neurogenesis, and they started using it on methamphetamine addicts, and those addicts reported a much, much lower recidivism rate, much lower relapse rate, and they could actually look and see that they weren't having that same neurogenesis after they stopped using methamphetamine. That's really important, because with anything that has an 88% relapse rate, we need to find something to fucking stop it. Meth is ravaging the Midwest of the United States right now, and anything that we can do that would inhibit meth addicts from having to go back to methamphetamine is a huge step forward. Again, we always have to think of unintended consequences. Any drug that's stopping neurogenesis might have other effects we don't want. But for now, if you can keep the person from doing a drug that ultimately statistically kills you on average in seven years, probably a good thing. All right, article number two. New research suggests that sexual abuse, but not other forms of abuse, cause children to hit puberty later than their non-abused peers. Damien thinks this is bad science. Connor thinks this is science. And this one is bad science. Though Connor's answer was much better because it's the opposite. So what happens is there is a hormonal imbalance. There is an issue with that, and it actually causes them to go to puberty earlier. So what this study found is that if you look at the victims of sexual abuse, they actually start puberty 8 to 12 months earlier than their peers in control groups. And what was most interesting to me, because I had a similar idea that Connor had of like, yeah, I could see that the stress hormones, the cortisol, everything pumping through your body, maybe that starts you to go to pu puberty earlier. 
But it doesn't happen with other trauma victims. They looked at non-sexual trauma victims. They did not have the same issue with a quicker onset of puberty. That's really interesting to me because what it's saying is there's something unique going on in either the brain or the hormones and physiology when a certain type of abuse happens. That specific thing is causing a physiological difference. Really, really interesting. Hopefully they can also, you know, stop people from getting sexually abused. But until then, at least we're knowing that we have to deal with other factors because what that means is when you're dealing with a sexual abuse victim, you're not just dealing with the mental issues of their abuse. You're actually dealing with different physiological issues that are going on in their body and knowing that might help us treat them later on. So I'm, I'm some very well-meaning school counselor right. at an elementary school. And I noticed that one girl's developing soon. Do I say, oh, it's just the milk, there's hormones and everything? Or do I call Child Protective Services right away? Not only that, but let me just say this. Let's say you're a farmer with some cows that you want to get to maturity to go to market earlier. (laughs) (laughs) I'm just saying. A good farmer knows how to treat a calf. Okay, article number three. Researchers have discovered a fish with an opioid-like venom. Both of you guys thought this one was science. And this one is science. It's called the Fang Blenny. It's very, very interesting. Connor mentioned, obviously, opioids we know from poppies. But this is one of the first issues of an opioid-like substance being derived from an animal as opposed to a plant. Very, very interesting. Now, this fish's bite, this is a tiny fish, by the way, it's two inches long. This fish's bite actually has three parts to it. One is a cone snail-like neuropeptide, cone snails being one of the most poisonous things on Earth. But it's also mixed with a scorpion-like lipase and an opioid peptide. What's really interesting about this is when they inject this into mice, unlike other things that sting that are in the same family and things like stingrays, which cause an immediate, horrible, burning pain, the mouse is like kind of dazed and wanders around, but it doesn't seem to actually be in pain. What's interesting is we think this happens like groupers and the predatory fish that are going after this tiny little fish. They get bit. They kind of like wander around. They don't know what's going on. They're out of it, but they're not necessarily instantly hurt. So think about this. They have a poison. And they have essentially a drug that masks the pain of the poison, but not necessarily the effect of it. Why would they do that as opposed to a sting, like a stingray? That's an open question. We don't know why. But I like to think it's because they are the drug dealers of the sea. Like, essentially, you want your fix, you come up and keep getting bit by this fish. Furthermore, these have now set themselves up to be the most popular aquarium fish ever. (laughs) How big How big are the fish that they normally sting? Are they bigger than it? Groupers can be huge. They can be many feet long. They're huge fish. Maybe that's what they, maybe they sting the grouper, so the grouper's more likely to be eaten. And since they're a small fish, they're just, they get to, to clean up after the grouper. I think you're going to see a whole bunch of people like Damien with meth addiction problems having a whole bunch of these fang blennies. All of a sudden, heroin addicts are going to become the best saltwater tank keepers on Earth. I mean, I, I know we just missed April Fool's Day, but I, I could picture throwing these guys in those spas where they have the fish nibble your Oh! Feet. <laughs> <laughs> the DEAs, they're like, we can't technically arrest you for this, but will you please stop because we have Oxycontin problems going crazy right now. We need the EPA. The EPA is the only one licensed to handle this. <laughs> <laughs> but they've been shut down. No. <laughs> uh, and lastly, article number four, researchers have found why humans only begin truly relating to other people at the age of four. And surprisingly, that reason has nothing to do with the brain. Damien thinks this is true. Connor thinks this is false. And this one is bad science, meaning Connor takes it for the day. Congratulations. Uh, that was a tie. Just so you a know. tie goes right to the scientist, Damien. We have talked about this of so course, many... See, that's the other thing, Connor. Yeah. He doesn't even know the rules. He forgets them every no, time. No, no, I, I, I know the rules. I just don't know why the tie It doesn't seem like you know the rules. I'm just saying it doesn't seem like you know the rules. You always complain about the rules. It seems like you don't know them. Well, okay, but the thing is, like, you've, you've cited baseball. The uh-huh. tie goes to the runner. At yeah. some point, everybody will get to be the base runner, or both teams will have a chance. I've never got to run the base. You've got a chance to go to school and then become a scientist. That's all you have to do. I'm just playing and a catcher but in very <laughs> figurative ways. So this is a really interesting study. It has everything to do with the brain, actually. This is a really interesting study because, like I said, I love these tests, these like kind of DIY things you can do at your house. You find your three- or four-year-old kid or nephew or whatever, you can do this experiment on them, and literally one day they will give you a different answer. And that day they are starting to relate differently. And you could say, what would cause that? What would cause somebody to suddenly have that ability. And the answer is, of course, in the brain. That's why it was a false. But it's really interesting in what it does. It's actually a linking of two different parts of the brain. 
So your brain has all these structures. They're working independently and they're working together. But when they're working together as a very young child, you're still forming neural pathways. This is a particular neural pathway where the fibers in a place called the arcuate facility, which is absolutely pronounced incorrectly, mature enough and they connect the back of the temporal lobe, which supports thinking about other people and other thoughts and stuff, to part of the frontal lobe that helps you sort out different levels of, of abstraction. What we think that means is all of a sudden a kid can apply, because before that a kid knows that person is angry. They understand other people has feelings. That's not a foreign concept to a three-year-old. But what they're doing is they're connecting the part of the frontal lobe that allows people to have abstract thoughts and think about things in different abstract ways. And that allows that child to put themselves in the position of somebody else and understand and analyze how and why they think in a certain way. This is really interesting because this is one of the hallmarks of what we consider humanity. A dog knows you're mad. A dog would not be able to pass this type of test. And if your child never passes the test, you can assume they have autism? Or, or... Maybe they're going to be a comedian. A sociopath. Yeah. yeah. I see what you're saying. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Very, oh. very interesting. Connor, congratulations. Your first time out and you spanked Damien on I Call BS. You absolutely trashing him. You tied the village idiot. You should feel shame. <laughs> Dragging his name well, through the dirt. Well, that's a spank. What's a win? <laughs> that you, you just won. You killed him. If you win, I spank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If I win, you spank me. <laughs> and both of us end the day by getting bit by the sweet opium fish. This is, and Connor, I'm sorry you get to, you have to miss out. Uh, this is normally the portion of the show where I would channel a dead scientist. Uh, we had a good one this week too. But, uh, before I got in here, before I came, uh, somebody broke into my car and the only, I searched my car. The only thing that was missing that I couldn't find was my show notes. Wow. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? We have an obsessive fan. I Lawrence have... Kraus. It's gotta be Kraus. <laughs> Trying to get to the secret of, of my channeling dead of my ability to communicate with the dead. Give us back our paperwork, Kraus. Could have at least stopped and said hi. We'll come on back next week and we'll do that once again. Thank you, Connor, for coming by for your first episode and get once again just putting Damien in his fucking place in I Call BS. Thank you, audience, for coming back for 168, where you learned about a possible cure for diabetes, how bad lead is for growing brains. Where to check out Lawrence Krauss's most recent work, What Happens to Meth Addicts After They Stop, How Sexual Abuse Can Change When You Hit Puberty, How a Fish Might Hold Your Next Heroin Fix, and Why a Four-Year-Old Suddenly Gains the Ability to Relate to Others. Thank you so much for joining us this week, and come on back next week for Science Faction 169. Hi, New Zealand-born creationist Ken Ham here. That lead article is... Pretty much more superhero origin story, mate. You've been listening to Science Fiction. Wait, that's not right.